On a warm summer day in the year 386, an African man from Algeria was sitting in his garden when he heard the voices of children playing. They were chanting in this game, and they were chanting the words in Latin, tola lega, tola lega, tola lega. In English, this is, pick it up, read it, pick it up, read it, pick it up, read it. Nearby was a scroll of St. Paul's letter to the church at Rome. So the man picked it up and read the passage that was just read here. And this passage was before him. It said, it is now the moment for you to wake up from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. One of the most misunderstood passages in the church. But that passage created in that man, St. Augustine, a heart transplant. For his heart was warmed and changed in that moment. Now when he read, make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires, Augustine saw that Paul was speaking to him and to his life. And the instinctive powers of fear and its correlates of rage and war and vengeance and addiction and abuse that had been driving his decisions and his life and his actions. Replace the word flesh with the word fear or insecurity. Now, I want to, that goes down to the bottom of what Paul meant by flesh. Replace the word flesh with the word fear or insecurity, and you will have the core of what Paul is trying to get across and what Augustine discovered. Now, if we go back a little bit, as Augustine did afterwards, at the beginning of this passage that awakened Augustine, and promises to awaken us and transplant our own hearts because that's what Christianity is about. It's not about rules, it's about a heart transplant. Are the following words, which we are most familiar and interestingly enough, which is at the core of every major religion. There is a statement like this in every major religion. You know what it is? Anyone take a guess? Love your neighbor as yourself. This morning I was listening to NPR when they talked about revisiting words that are so familiar we have forgotten their power. But that's what I want us to think about, the power of that passage and what it means to change our hearts, to give us a heart transplant for this kind of love that Paul, that word that he uses, and he has one out of four choices of words in Greek, this word has little to do with emotion, has little to do with falling in love. The love to which he refers is a force field of goodwill, of seeing the other as neighbor and not as alien. This kind of love involves letting go of fear. Perfect love casts out fear. And its inner compulsion, that inner compulsion of anxiety and insecurity to make us want to control another so we feel better. You know that compulsion to react. And then later you look back and you think, why did I do that? Why did I say that? Well, it never happens to you, but it happens to me. It's compulsion to 
comfort ourselves at the expense of another and not to set a boundary between what is comforting to us and what truly comforts another. It's compulsiveness to punish another because we're hurt or offended. It's compulsion to form opinions and take action without taking the time to understand, pray, or listen. Well, this past week I needed to be reminded of this aspect of love. Kathy, Anna, and I were watching the newly released 9-11 tapes of the communication among air traffic controllers, military leaders, and emergency operators uh, on that horrific day. The producers did an interesting thing. They, they put the camera on those individuals, and, and we saw them as they were listening to the tapes of them speaking and reacting as this whole drama that they had never experienced before unfolded for them and for everyone else. What came through time and again was how utterly incomprehensible was this new world that was taking shape. There were no bearings. There were no prior reference points, no wise experts to turn to for guidance, no source of reassurance. He saw it even in the president's face. No cavalry riding in to save the day at the last minute. No John Wayne. And we laugh, but we forget that we are hardwired culturally to expect a John Wayne. Watching all this unfold from this sudden sadder and wiser present moment made me realize, and I'm speaking for me, maybe it's true for you, but it's taken me years to appreciate the full impact of that event and the trauma and how that e trauma has shaped our lives and our society and is still shaping it. Even today, as we watch very frightening images from ISIS or beheadings or even Ebola, as we watch radicalized young men that are not from the third world but are from the first world, middle class men raised by loving parents who are radicalized. It's hard to comprehend what deep force field of anger or despair has captivated them and made them act according or against their very nature. And I think about the anger that erupts online and, and in uh, various and vindictive statements and I realize underneath that is that insecurity. How often do we talk about security? Insecurity because we want someone. We want the president, we want the Congress, we want the church, we want someone to reassert control and tell us it will be all right and they're not doing it and it makes us mad. And rather than coming together in neighborliness and mutual support, we blame one another. This one's acting too slowly, that one's too reactionary because it's a whole new world. And we want the comfort of the old, the reassuring, and the calm. In the face of all this trauma, in the midst of the compulsion to regress and blame, Paul gives us simple lines that have the power to take us out of this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Be caught up in that force field of neighborliness not when life is calm and nice, but in the midst of the anxiety and the insecurity. In spite of it all, love your neighbor as yourself. Be caught up in that force field. Lay aside the clothing of trauma, the reactivity, the anger, the fear, all that Paul calls flesh that takes us nowhere and sink deeply into the grace and power of Christ, which is like a warm bath. Clothe yourself with that. 
Now, this is not easy. The next morning after watching that 9-11 show, my daughter, who was just getting a master's in security studies, said, you know, Dad, I'm really interested in doing this program in Beirut. Beirut? No, was my instinct. I wanted to lay before her all the exquisite dangers I wanted her not to consider that as her next step. But that's the trauma speaking. And that's my own insecurity working on me. And if I follow that way of fear, I will want to control every bit of her life and keep her from dangerous risks. My faith asked me to lay aside those works of darkness and put on the way of Jesus the way of love that Paul outlines, that love invites me to set a boundary between my fear, anxiety, insecurity, and reactivity and her life so she can follow the way that God is outlining for her in her own heart. Now, this way is nearly impossible for me, but it is not impossible for Christ working in you and me, says Paul, the former terrorist, and he knows. But it does mean a death. It means we have to dare to be crucified to an old self and an old way, a way that still has dominance and a way our neighbors and friends are still captivated by. And the resurrection to a whole new self. It means an honest self-appraisal and examination to identify the source of our works, or what we might say today, our decisions and actions. Do they come from the darkness of fear and trauma and prejudice, or from the light of God's word? We have to be realistic with ourselves, which is always a word of neighborly love and compassion, loving our neighbor as ourself, because our neighbor is ourself. Maybe as a church, it's time to cast away the works of darkness. Maybe it's time to cast away the negativity, the infighting over who is right and who is wrong, the judgmentalism. Maybe as parents, it's time to take our children's religious lives as seriously as we take their intellectual and athletic lives, myself included. And maybe as a people, it is time to sit in Augustine's garden and hear again the childlike voices calling out, Tolalega, Tolalega, pick it up and read it. Read this new way. Now is the time to take a different way, to divest ourselves of the dark clothing of fear and reactivity that others are wearing. Now is the time to be church, to put on the neighborly love of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right now, that's about all we can do. But you know, that's all we could ever do, and it's enough. Because our faith tells us, love your neighbor as yourself. And that love is a mustard seed that can grow a new church, a new society, and a new world, person by person. Amen.